Thank you, everyone, for your time today. We really appreciate you being here with us. Uh, today we're going to talk about aligning our strategies, our analytic strategies, to address tomorrow's payment reform. This is Scott Everett with PDS. I am the Vice President of Analytic Solutions here, and I'm grateful to be joined today by Ken Bradley from Navicure. Um, a lot of what we're seeing with our clients out there and a lot of what we're seeing in the, the realm of analytics is a focus on visualization technology. We know in healthcare that there's just a ton of data out there, and it's really difficult sometimes to make sense of it all. Visualization technology is something that can be really powerful to look at things like maybe look at all of our diabetic patients in New York. And this is something that quickly and easily allows you to take the data and put it in a format that allows you to look at it strategically, where you could look and say, okay, here's where our patient populations reside, and it'll help us to look at things strategically like placement of wellness clinics or outreach opportunities that are out there. And this is just one example of you know the power of visualization and analytics that are out there to help really improve the communication throughout your organization and improve transparency to so that everybody knows what's going on and can really be accountable for the success of the organization altogether. Tools like these are things that PDS has been specializing in for over 20 years. We, we work heavily in the area of analytics and dashboarding visualizations like you just saw. And it's focused specifically on healthcare where we've implemented solutions related to revenue cycle, physician comp, patient access, much, much more on this. Today we're working with Ken Bradley from Navicure. Ken is the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives there, and he's spent a lot of his career in the healthcare industry as well and has a, a great knowledge of current trends and in what works to uh, really bring success to the healthcare organization. Ken's responsible for assess assessing regulatory and industry change within Navicure. And Ken, could you just take a minute and introduce us to uh, Navicure and what you do there? Sure. Thanks, Scott. First, I want to say thanks to everyone at PDS for letting me participate in today's important discussion. Um, Navicare's mission is to partner with medical practices with a common goal of maximizing revenue cycle efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, we provide tools to help automate the revenue cycle, to automate the identification, collection of claim non-payment, collect patient pay, and also provide decision supporting information. We enable practices of all sizes to maximize payer and patient collections. We're fortunate and grateful to be partnered with over 120,000 medical professionals, all sizes and types, uh, from coast to coast since 2001. Um, and we've been industry and independently awarded for our technology and our service uh, year after year by industry experts such as MGMA, Blackbook, Class, and Stevie. And I'd like to say thank you uh, again and hello, everyone. So one of the things we'd like to do before we really get into uh, this topic is provide a survey for you. So if you could just take a minute on, on your screen and utilize the, the survey tool, what we want to understand from you guys is how familiar you are with the new macro regulations that are coming up and how they'll maybe impact reimbursement for your organization. Okay, looks like most of the people have voted in. Um, I appreciate you doing that. It looks like we have some who are very knowledgeable, but most, most of the people have some, some gaps with what they're doing. Most are somewhat familiar or have a, a pretty limited knowledge base of what they're doing. And I hope this webinar is useful for you today to, to help bring you up and be a little bit more comfortable or at least more knowledgeable about what's going on. So with that, I appreciate your participation. And Ken, can you maybe kick us off and let us know what you know about MACRA and what we can do to uh, help our organization be successful with this. Sure. And it looks like from the survey, those results reflect what we're seeing in the market as well. There's a wide range of understanding of MACRA. But first, let me give you something that you can impress your coworkers with. What does MACRA stand for? Well, it stands for Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015. And let me start by saying it's a big law. It was passed in 2015 with overwhelming bipartisan support. And now let's say what it isn't and what it is. First, it isn't. It isn't the Affordable Care Act. It isn't Obamacare. It's not what they're talking about in Washington now about repealing or replacing. It's a completely different law. Um, and some of the things that are in it um, might surprise some of you, but the first is that it repeals the sustained growth rate, and that's probably what most of you are familiar with, if you remember that worrisome, nagging SGR formula that they 
tried to apply every year that they end up repealing, fortunately, most of the time. Well, MACRA permanently repeals that. Another part of MACRA says that Medicare can no longer use the Social Security number as the beneficiary ID, ID beginning April 2018. So what's going to happen is between April 2018 and December 2019, Medicare is going to be issuing new beneficiary IDs that will, not, will no longer be the Social Security number. So some of you may not be aware of that. The third thing that it does is it streamlines several bonus payment uh, methodologies, and some of these we're very familiar with. PQRS, Meaningful Use, Value Modifier, they just are called something different, um, which is pretty typical with a lot of these laws. They've just been renamed to something else. But the good thing is now they're all streamlined to work together under a single umbrella with this new law. The fourth thing is that it creates, um, in a much greater way, um, the ideas around advanced value-based reimbursement. And so in general, we can look at MACRA as a blueprint for a transition from fee-for-service to risk-based, quality-metric-driven reimbursement models. This is going to require practices take action and make many decisions here in the future, pretty short term as well. So change is required, and this means that practices are going to need to decide how and when to take the necessary steps. Today's important topic around data and analytics is going to be critical and important, we think, for most practices to be ready for this new change. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of time to start. 2017 actions determine, determine Medicare 2019 adjustments. So many practices really need to start this process by asking lots of questions. Questions such as, what types of cash reserves do you have on hand to handle declining or delayed payments? Do you have the necessary clinical network to support team health? Critically important, do you have the IT infrastructure to support collaborative care and these new reimbursement models? What are your payers up to? What kind of contracts do you have in place? Do you understand what types of quality metrics you should report today and which ones you should get better at for later reporting? So let's take a look at some of the components of today's revenue cycle. For the most part, it's centered around facilities, departments, and specialties. Treatment and payment is silo. There's really not a lot of collaboration there. No one talks to each other. We're not really meaning that in a businesses are usually separate, independent of each other, and really aren't talking together as what we would consider a team. Volume generally means more success, more revenue. And in some ways, we can say there's no accountability, and by that, we really mean no transparency around the quality and the cost of, that, of the services that are being provided today. Patients, unfortunately, are left to figure out this maze of treatment and payment. And providers are likely not coding for, for HCCs, complications, and highest specificities. And why we think that's important to point out is that in the future, these are things that are going to determine how practices are viewed externally. So if those are not being coded today, the outside world may like, likely not know some of the great work that you're doing and some of the complicated work that, that we're doing. So value-based care and reimbursement is the future. So let's look at what a new value-based care reimbursement system might look like. Well, it's going to have some new components and some very new ideas. Coordinated patient care across the care continuum. Systems that capture and easily report costs that are associated with treatment throughout that care continuum. There's going to be much greater collaboration of hospitals, specialists, peers, and other high-quality low-cost care providers, team-based reimbursement and risk contracts and payment distributions and methodologies are going to be much more prevalent in this new revenue cycle um, that we're going to be seeing in the future. Compliance mechanisms to ensure both your compliance and the compliance of your partners is going to be critical to success as well. As well. So how can we begin and what do we need to do to begin? So Scott's going to talk a little bit about how technology can help and technology's role in this new future. Thanks, Ken. Um, really, when you look at it, if you're going to transform the way that you're doing business, it's going to be difficult if the, the technology remains the same. If you look at current state, particularly around like billing systems, you'll notice that it's really focused on single visits, episodes of care, 
I billed Joe for this, I billed Nancy for that, I got paid, rinse and repeat. Technology is going to have to evolve with the new revenue cycle methodologies as well, where it's going to have to focus more around patients and not just the, the billing of the patients, but problem lists, looking at continuity of care, looking at quality and outcomes. And it's also not just collections, but also cost tracking and containment of, of costs along these lines and looking at quality measures in addition to just volumes and, and revenues because quality is what's going to lead to enhanced revenue opportunities that are out there. So what we've seen with the best practices out there regarding technology is really a need to manage the data that's coming in. Again, there's a lot of data that's being captured in all of these areas, but it's identifying what's critical to you and your organization and making it work and presenting it in a way that's effective. Um, it needs to be updated frequently. It needs to run across the entire patient population that's there, and it needs to be something that's set up and staged in a way that the people who need to see it can do so in a secure environment and can have a tool that is easy to use, easy to interpret, and provide highly graphical information that can be distributed throughout the organization. So I don't know what you're seeing on your side of the, the ledger there, Ken. Um, I know, you know those are the best practices and, and what we're seeing with regard to technology that's coming across. Absolutely. The discussion of data, data that's turned into information and therefore analytics, it's going to drive much of the decision making in the future. It's going to be fundamental to be successful, to be able to have accurate, timely information for qualitative or in quality decision making is going to be critical to success in the 21st century. Also remember that a lot of what is reported and what a lot in, in the future will become how the outside world judges the quality of the services that were provided, as well as what those costs are. However, we think capturing and displaying the right data could likely be the biggest challenge for most practices going forward. This is a new idea, and it's going to be critically important that practices know how to capture this information, display it correctly, not only internally uh, for decision making, but also to be able to report it accurately to the outside world. So before diving deeper, let's talk about how value will shape our future goals. So as we begin to map our journey into value-based care and reimbursement, let's consider some, some guiding principles, some overarching goals. Well, the first that we'll want to consider putting up there as a, as a guiding principle will be to emphasize value over volume. And after we've met those quality objectives and are maintaining those quality objectives, then we can ramp up the volume. In every approach, whether or not it be for the care that's delivered, for the transitions of care and how that happens, the financial aspects, the patient needs to be at the center of all, all of our thinking, all of our approaches to, to delivering care and how, how it's paid for. And likely many of you will need to partner with someone external to your practice to provide, quote, complete, unquote, care. So choose partners wisely. And these partners may not be perfect today, but what's important is that they have and you have all the same objectives toward this overall goal of providing quality value, value care. And the future does require that we think differently. And today we'll discuss how analytics helps us be prepared for this new future. Yeah, Ken, you know, as we talk a little bit about the future that way, we're, we're noticing changes in trends in analytics in the, that industry as well. Um, and really, the focus is always the same. It's always improving transparency, always improving communication throughout the organization, and getting key data, key metrics, key information out to those who need it to be able to manage change. What's critical, though, is that you look at just the metrics that are that are important to you, that you can't overwhelm yourself by trying to do everything all at once. And then to visualize those metrics through the use of some of these tools that are out there like we saw before. But the visualization isn't even really just enough. What's important is the story behind the measures that are out there. What's it telling us? Not, as, not only what's going on, but why it's going on. And in order to do that, we can't just be throwing a bunch of charts and graphs out there. There needs to be a flow with the analytics and annotations, with trend indicators and, and easily digestible information. 
we need to highlight successes in addition to quickly and easily identifying performance gaps and do it in a fairly speedy manner so that people who have the ability to change the way that you're doing things can notice these downward trends right away and make quick corrections to those. So one example of this is, say, in the realm of position compensation. And you can see how the future is going to change the way that we work with physicians in contracting with them and in compensating them for the care that they're providing. In the past, or even today, you could use simple volume metrics like collections or RVUs to say, you know, to provide payers with or providers with the information that they need to show here's where you are, here's where we think you're going to end the year, and here's what we're projecting your compensation will be at year end. Well, as the revenue cycle becomes more complex, it only makes sense that we align our incentives that we're giving to our those who are providing the care with organizational goals as well, so that you can see that we need to incentivize these providers for greater quality of care. We need to incentivize these providers to help the organization meet their quality and volume goals, which are out there regarding things like patient satisfaction, patient access, clinical quality. And then we need to be able to model those into new compensation plans for the provider so that they can see what they're doing today and how they're doing business today will impact their compensation going forward. So we'd like to talk a little bit about some of the recommendations that we have for aligning this strategy moving forward. But before that, we'd like to take another quick survey, pull up this survey, and want to understand where you guys think you are with regard to your use of analytics moving forward into the, the future, particularly in regards to uh, future payment reform. It looks like a few of you are pretty confident in where you're headed. Most of you think you'll, think you'll be ready, but maybe have a couple of areas to, to work with. There are a couple who um, are, are struggling and may need some more work in the organization in that area. With that, Ken's put together some recommendations on how to move your organization better towards being ready for what's involved with, with payment reform. And I'll talk a little bit about how some analytics, your analytics strategy can really play a role in uh, helping you be successful that way. So, Ken, what do you recommend clients do to move forward? Yes, we have put together some recommendations for practices. We think I'm at a minimum should look at these as, as not necessarily steps, but just some thought-provoking ideas that can help you begin at least that journey towards value-based care and reimbursement. And our first recommendation is to become more operationally efficient. And the reason we say that is you're going to need processes and tools to help you measure and assess your internal financial and operational capabilities. As a part of that, you want to automate everything to cut your operational costs. You're going to want to be able to do this so that not only do your operational costs can be reduced, but it provides more data for analytics. It also helps you, as you become more operationally efficient, it frees up resources uh, that can be used for other things. It also helps you make sure that you're heading in the right way and identifies problems. Um, and remember, it's better for you to be able to see what's happening inside your practice and before the rest of the world, the rest of the world does that. So short term, we think being operationally efficient is a wise move. By automating everything, you can help reduce your operational cost, and that does provide more fuel, uh, more data to drive those analytics. More long term, you're going to want to think clinical. So, you know, quite frankly, the, the, the industry is still trying to nail down clinical interoperability. So, but as you think through or as you look at products or enhancements to your clinical data solutions, you'll want ones that ensure that that data follows the, the patient throughout the care continuum that's in, even, and out of your particular practice hub, perhaps. Um, you'll also want to make sure that that data, that clinical data, is, is available to all providers at all times of care. So that's kind of our short-term and our long-term view to, to kind of get you started. We think analytics is, so we can see analytics is going to help with this objective. Great. Well, as we, as we move on to the second recommendation, we're seeing that and we're asking that many of you may be doing this some of some of this today, 
but a much more comprehensive way um, is to measure and assess your current financial and operational performance for your payers and providers and perhaps even, even your partners. So many of you are probably doing some of this today, but we think a much more comprehensive review of things like your gross and net collection numbers, clean claim rates, denial rates, hassle factors. So by that we mean you know, how many times do you have to submit a claim before it gets paid. Um, these are going to be critical as we move forward into a much more complex revenue cycle. You're going to need to know these numbers pretty much instantaneously. And who you partner with is important. So understanding which payers, which providers, which partners is going to be very important in the future. So those partnerships are going to be important. Your goal here is to get operationally efficient again and for you to understand how financially successful you are with your payers so you can make those decisions about basically who you want to do business with. It's going to be critical that we make, again, the right partnership decisions going forward. So with recommendation two, we were thinking about and suggesting an internal review of how successful you are um, internally um, and how and with those with those partners that you have today. In our third recommendation, we're suggesting that you begin to assess your ex external environment, in particular with your payers. So what payers are in your market? What types of networks and alternative payment models do they have now or what ones are they planning? What are your competitors doing and what are they up to? Can you get their quality and cost numbers? Likewise, for your referral partners, what are their quality and cost numbers? It's important to begin this assessment so that you have a full picture of really what you're going to be up against and also know who could potentially be your partners in the future. So understanding uh, the payers, what they're up to is critical. And equally critical is an understanding of the patients that you provide services to. So our fourth recommendation is to begin an assessment of your patient population and then answer what services you're providing to that patient population. What is the patient demographic? What does your patient demographic look like? What types of conditions are you treating? Do you have a patient stratification um, and a cohort analysis ready for review? You know, what types of chronic conditions and comorbidities are you, are you treating and do these patients have? Who are your high quali um, utilizers and why? Um, what are the top services that you're providing today? Um, this is important to ensure that you're providing the right services and who we're currently or, or may decide to partner with um, in the future. So in addition, understanding the complex makeup of conditions you treat can provide sources of new revenue. And I think Scott wants to talk about the ways that we can start to see by understanding our patient population that we have some new potential revenue opportunities here. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Risk adjustment, risk acuity, risk stratification is something that we've been working with clients more and more on recently. And it's something that is really a great tool that's out there for uh, not just your clinical teams and your operations team, but your finance and contracting teams as well. Risk analysis is really about utilizing risk scores. Um, what you're trying to do with your risk analysis is identify your at-risk patients, your outliers that are out there, and working with them across the, the organization to really kind of contain the costs associated with with the with this limited population that's out there now this is involves more than just you know care managers and, and groups it really involves communication throughout the organization as a whole and what's nice about this is while it is in more work it's also a new source of revenue this is something that's been adopted by cms as a way of reimbursing providers for containing costs along the, the sicker patient populations that are out there. But it's something that's going to be adopted by commercial plans more and more as well. So if you're going to try to do this with your commercial payers and you want to try to negotiate plans, you're going to need a lot of information at your fingertips to understand where you are and what are some of the things that you can work with your payers on in order to kind of maximize this opportunity. You can see a visualization up here right now which really shows easily your highest risk patients that are out there and can help apply filters to look at that and again identify the outliers that are there. You can see in the, the patient volume the spikes which are there. 
You can also apply filters and, and highlight to understand the individual HCC codes that exist within the different categories, and even some patient-specific risk detail that's out there. Uh, this is something that will help you understand the revenues that are associated with these and, and, again, give you a better understanding of the costs that are there so that you can work with your payers to really kind of keep those more in line with what they would expect and provide better care at the same time. Now, this information that you're seeing here, then, can be funneled into a provider dashboard that can be distributed out to individual providers on a periodic basis, whether it's weekly or monthly, to really give them a quick view of their specific practice, of their specific patient population, and help them understand their role in the organization in, again, providing better care, helping keep these patients healthy, and again, containing the costs that are associated with this so that we can drive volume over a broader base of patients rather than trying to drive volume over increased services to just a few. So it sounds like this new, this new revenue cycle that we may have in the future does have some new revenue potential as well, and that's exciting, I think, for all of us to hear. Our fifth recommendation and our sixth recommendation, so the next couple of recommendations are really around cost. So the fifth recommendation is to determine as accurately as possible what your cost is to provide the services that you make up. Uh, most of your revenue. So by that, what we mean is we're kind of getting to a cost, a cost accounting idea here, but is we need a detailed understanding of the services that we provide today and who is providing the care. So it's very likely that physician time is the most costly. So ask yourself, could a nurse practitioner do some of, do some of these services or some service component and free up our physicians to see additional patients? I mean, that's a, great, that's a great opportunity to not only expand your, your patient base, but make your physicians really more, more efficient even. But make sure to make changes only after you understand your current contract requirements. We have to make very, very sure that you do things in conjunction and make all of these types of changes in conjunction after a complete, full understanding of what your current contractual obligations and requirements are. So after you have an understanding of cost, we can perhaps then use this information to strategically cut costs. And how can we cut costs administratively and potentially even clinically? So start asking questions. You know, can we automate? We've kind of been saying, at least on the revenue cycle side, Navicare sees ways that we can streamline the, the revenue cycle and make practices much more operationally efficient, again, freeing up costs and resources for, for other things. You know, on the clinical side, can you reuse a test that was done outside your office? Now you're beginning to think in the value-based world uh, when you ask questions like that. Um, your DME cost and utilization. You know, can you do something to reduce hospitalization or de emergency department usage? Such things as additional office hours. Again, though, do these things and make sure that you're sitting at a table with your with your contract, your your payer side uh, contract negotiators that make sure you get credit for doing things like this. And finally, other things, some of newer ideas around telehealth, you know, to assist in managing patients with chronic illness. Um, but again, make sure you're, you're not prohibited from doing this contractually or by state, by state law. So finally, when deciding to cut costs, please remember quality always comes first. Get the quality aspects nailed First, get those nailed solid. Make sure that your quality metrics stay stay the same or hopefully even continually improve. But don't cut cost just to cut cost. Make sure your quality metrics remain superior to, you, to at least your competitors and make sure your patients are satisfied with the quality that they're getting. Scott, I think Scott wants to look at cost, though, in, in more detail. Thanks, Ken. You know, Talking about healthcare costs is, is a major topic everywhere you go. You look at the news and as they try to pass legislation in Washington around healthcare, they're always talking about we've got to contain costs, we've got to reduce costs, healthcare costs are out of control. Well, I, I think we need to understand there are different perspectives around healthcare costs and what that means to different people. Obviously, you have the patient perspective and when they think of healthcare costs, they're thinking of how much is their premium, how much is their out-of-pocket deductible and coinsurance, and what are they in particularly spending on their own 
healthcare that's out there. And obviously, they would like to see those go down as much as possible. From a payer perspective, it's interesting because what they see as cost is what we see as revenue. Their cost is what they're paying out to us for the care of their subscribers. And so when they say they want to see their costs go down that way, what they're saying is, is they want to pay out less money to the, the providers or at least pay out less money per patient or per condition or risk factor that they can show that they're coming in under what they think their actuarial expectations would be. Now, from a private provider perspective, healthcare costs are what it actually costs us to provide the care. And there's lots of factors that go into that. You have your direct costs, like your physician provider compensation, you have your supplies, but then you have a lot of indirect costs that are associated with that as well. Your billing expenses, your contracting, your technology expenses, and all the overhead that's associated with it. And this is something that's very difficult to, one, grab a hold of altogether, and two, really be able to allocate that and understand how it falls into a risk or patient population going that way. Again, what I talked about before is the best way for us to be successful with this payment reform is to drive down our costs if we're going to be able to help the patients and the payers be able to find success in what they're attempting to do as well. You can look at something like this where maybe applying budget data to the analytics that you have out there and showing variances to budget. Again, it helps you to quickly identify problems that are out there, catch them and correct them before they spiral out of control if you're providing dashboards like these on a, on a frequent basis to management, to uh, payers, to finance, and those who can really understand the data, show these variances and, and quickly catch problem areas that, that may be going on in the organization. So Ken, what are our other recommendations out there that, that we can really improve on? Well, I think our seventh recommendation is a recommendation that I think can be the most fun, and that is define your value propositions. What are the things that you're doing today that you, frankly, can brag about? What are the things that make you different from everyone else in your market? Um, what do you do better you know, than anything else, both in terms of quality and or cost? On the flip side of that, what do you do a lot of that might be that you might want to take a closer look at to say, you know, could we do this better or can we make, is there room for improvement? As part of this recommendation, again, are you coding the, all the services you're providing? So you may be providing really good clinical, detailed, complex care, but if it's not coded, then you can't really brag about it. You can't really show the world, you know, uh, the quality care that you're providing um, and hopefully, you know, at competitive prices. So analytics is going to play a big role in assisting this understanding of both strengths and weaknesses, we think. And as you become more aware of costs, strengths, and weaknesses, unfortunately, our eighth step means that you're also going to need to learn a little bit more and do a little bit more fact-gathering. That is to learn about MIPS, APMs. I love all the acronyms. So merit-based incentive payment programs, alternative payment models are something that will be a big part of our vernacular if they're not already. In the, in the future. But really what these are, MIPS is more, more around bonus-based metric-driven report, reporting, and the alternative-based uh, payment models are the risk-based models. These are ones where you're assuming risk. There's greater reward, but also greater risk when you do those, which means really a really good understanding of what each of these programs uh, requires. What are the benefits, the rewards, and how does it match up to your current strengths? So you're going to need to create a roadmap, a strategy, if you will, for your unique practice. Hopefully that strategy is going to take advantage of your strengths, short-term and long-term, um, and it's going to give you time to pay for and work, work on the weaknesses. So now is the time to move forward and put all of this together. And in our recommendation number nine, now we can start thinking fully about the future. We can start thinking about how our practice fits into this value-based care, value-based reimbursement world. So with recommendation nine, we say turn up the turn up the value. You know, once you become more operationally efficient, you have a revenue cycle that's that's lean and mean, that's 
automated, that has, you know, all this data now that's being uh, created that can go into your analytics tools that you have in place, your understanding of your internal strengths and your cost and your external environment. You can use this to begin to lay out your roadmap to value-based care and reimbursement. So as you remember, if you can remember through our guiding principles and keep those in mind, the patient and patient care is at the center of our thinking. So what would it take to provide end-to-end -end care for that patient? You may own that end-to-end, -end, or you may only be a part of that, but how those, pro how those processes and how that care is delivered is going to be critical to success in the, in the new future, which is really the definition of a team. Care is going to be composed of team members from end-to-end -end in the future. Some of those team members may be outside of your practice. They may be even outside of your control. So as we mentioned earlier, it's important that your partnerships, the, the partnerships that you choose are going to be critical. You need to have the same uh, goals, the same attitude, the same vision, if you will, to be successful when you work with your partners. And then finally, when we talk about the cost side of this, as we, as we put all of this together, we need to think about an end-to-end -end price, and we'll really talk about a bundled price. So what can we provide working as a team collectively, do better than anyone else in the world, and in particular in our competitive market, as a team? And what would that look like? And what would that bundle be called? And what would we, what would we price it at? So now that's beginning to think in the value world. And as you get better and better, you can take on more risk. You can take on more not only more risk, but then you get more revenue um, opportunities. So as we consider our last recommendation, it's certainly not the least important. Um, it may actually be one of the most important, even though it is our last recommendation, is to continually measure and monitor performance. Don't just measure one time. Don't just look at your statistics and your analytics, you know, one time or even one time during the month. Look at them all the time. Put the important statistics, like Scott said, on the view and make sure that the, the people that are responsible for those particular statistics can see those numbers, can continually look at those numbers so that we can, we can make the tweaks that are necessary for continuous improvement. These, the monitoring of performance, the analytics that are around this, help us answer are we heading the right way, are we asking the right questions, are we doing the right things. And remember the things that we're seeing today are the things that the world will see in the future. The way the world is going to look at us is what is likely the, the benchmarks that we're seeing today. So those are going to, at some point, be transparent, potentially to even our patients, but certainly to our peers, certainly to our providers. So analytics how and how accurate they are, how easy they are to, to see, is going to play a critical role in guiding us through this complex transmission. And I think Scott wants to show us an example of, of how we can put information in front of the right people at the right time in the right way. Thanks, Ken. It, really what's important to understand with, again, improving transparency and improving communication out there is that you don't overwhelm your end users with a ton of metrics that are out there. Obviously, there are lots and lots of things you can measure. There are lots and lots of things that are important to care. But What's important is being able to give the people who are trying to manage change the information that they need and just the information that's most critical to them. And what is really important are, are giving them quick answers, giving them more than just they don't want a bunch of numbers to try to have to digest and spend a lot of time looking at reports. They want quick and easy trend indicators like you see above. Here's where we're doing well. Here's where we're struggling. Let's put plans in place in order to fill those gaps. You want to be able to understand five or six key questions that need to be answered, and are they being answered the right way, or are they, is this a place where we're struggling? And you want to give them quick views to trends. Are trends moving in the right direction? Look at percentages and pie charts of, you know, are these percentages that we're seeing appropriate and what we want to be seeing, and then highlighting just the three or four key numbers that they're accountable for finding success with. Now, one of the things that's important is understanding that 
what you provide to finance may have to be a little bit different than what you provide to patient access, which may be a little bit different to what you're providing to operations, et cetera. All of these things are critical and all of these things are out there, but this is just one way to enhance the flow and enhance the communication is providing quick and easy answers to those who are trying to work with the data. So, Ken, I don't know if you can summarize for us real quick what we've talked about today and what are really the key elements that people need to be working on moving forward. Sure. Yeah, today we've talked an awful lot about, a cha uh, awful lot about change. But I would like to remind everyone, Rome wasn't built in a day or so I've heard. Remember this is a journey, one that requires a roadmap. It requires the right tools, the right uh, attitude, and certainly the right partners to be successful. You're going to want to manage your finan the financial impact for risk and incentive-based contracts. These are the future. Tools to assess and model these will be absolutely necessary. You'll want to identify and stratify patients with HCCs year over year actively target patient appointments to manage clinical outcomes and revenue impact. Importantly, you'll want to use analytics and dashboards to communicate with physicians and employees. This accurate and easily understood information is going to be vital to the modern practice in the future. Identify competitive operational and financial risks that are associated with patient population. So in summary, the industry has taken the first steps away from fee-for-service to value-based care and reimbursement. MACRA made it a requirement for Medicare, but I think we have to look around and we can see that the private payers have really jumped on this bandwagon. They're increasingly requiring these types of changes, and which is, in essence, going to require practices uh, to make these adjustments to, to be successful in a value-based care and value-based reimbursement world. So our belief that all practices can thrive, but it's going to require careful planning, they're going to need the right tools, and importantly, they're going to need the right partners. I'd like to thank you very much for, uh, for letting me participate, and it's been a pleasure being here. Thanks, Ken. Um, from our perspective, looking at this from an analytical side of things, I, changes are coming, and in order to prepare for that, it's really important to take an inventory internally of what are your current tool sets? How are your analytics team? Do you have what you're going to need in order to be able to uh, effectively communicate and distribute information throughout your organization to the people who need it? Have you seen the gaps that you have and do you have a plan in place to align your strategies to stay ahead of the curve? And as things do change, what do you have in place in order to self-monitor, in order to really look in and see how you're doing, how you're performing, and are you keeping up with the changes or is the industry outpacing you? And in cases like that, what do you have in place in order to be able to self-correct the ship before things spiral out of control? So with that, I thank you all for your participation today, and please keep your eye out for um, additional webinars coming out from uh, PDS in the very near future. Thank you.